welcome to the Wilson Center. Um, not the actual Wilson Center, but the virtual Wilson Center. I am now President Emerita. We have the uh, Latin correct, uh, Jane Harmon. Uh, I'm also a recovering politician. We'll have that conversation with my friend John Katko in just a moment. And in addition to all that, I am the grandmother to eight perfect grandchildren plus one institution. And the name of that institution is the Homeland Security Committee of the House of Representatives, and maybe even the Homeland uh, Department, because I was there. And uh, in the end, I was one of its uh, principal advocates. But so I'm, I'm delighted uh, to welcome the ranking member of the committee. I'm also delighted, uh, shamelessly, to tell everybody on this call that I'm the author of a new book on uh, US security policy called, get ready, Insanity Defense why our failure to confront hard national security problems makes us less safe. We can go into that later, but I'm really thrilled uh, to feature uh, uh, my friend, John Katko, who, as I said, is ranking member of the House Homeland Security Committee. Uh, and I'm, we're honored that you chose the Wilson Center to speak about your policy agenda for the 117th Congress. Uh, John Katko is in his fourth term, he represents New York's 24th Congressional District, a lawyer by training, just like me. Um, I'm recovering, he's probably a much better lawyer. John served in the Justice Department in various roles, including in the Criminal uh, Division's Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs section, in which he served as a senior trial attorney on the uh, US-Mexico border in El Paso. And they have some resonance to stuff going on right now. Uh, later, he was a federal organized crime prosecutor for the Northern District of New York. So he has extensive experience in the homeland security space. Uh, John and I will have a conversation. And I gather that because he has to leave 10 minutes early for a vote, uh, we'll probably pass questions. If you have the question you must, must, must ask. Uh, please be in direct touch with Meg King, and I assume everyone has knows how to do that. And by the way, before I, I uh, start uh, um, my conversation with you, John, I, I cannot say enough about uh, what Meg King brings to the Wilson Center and her leadership of the Science, Technology, and Innovation Program, which now, new drumroll, in addition to training Capitol Hill staff, which we have done for years, on cyber and AI, we are now training exec the executive branch. New, new thing. And they're signing up in droves and we had to turn away 50% of the folks who wanted to be in, in the first class. So, you know, go Meg, you really are an amazing talent. Okay, so uh, we're having a conversation, right, John? Do, would you like to say anything at the outset? You're welcome to. Or um, I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy to have the conversation with, with the esteemed Jane Harmon. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, uh, I look forward to the conversation. I spent my adult life in law, in law enforcement. I'm looking forward to it. So let me start. I, I, I've got questions on everything that you want to talk about, but let me ask a, a, a threshold question. I mentioned that I'm the grandmother of the Homeland Security Committee and a, a co-grandmother of the Homeland Security Department. I was on the committee when it was formed. I was one of the original members. Uh, it was then a, it wasn't a full-fledged uh, committee. For four years, it had temporary status. Uh, Chris Cox of California chaired it, a uh, fabulous guy. Uh, and I remember day three or whatever, we had a retreat in the Maryland countryside uh, to talk about what the jurisdiction of the committee would be. And it was always clear during my eight years before you were there, John, that we were begging for jurisdiction from all the other committees of Congress. Uh, one of the last unfilled recommendations of the 9-11 Commission, which was co-chaired by Lee Hamilton, my predecessor at Wilson uh, and a former member himself, was that the jurisdiction of Congress needed to change so that there was a real, vibrant, fully jur jurisdiction committee uh, focused on the homeland enterprise. Uh, can you update us, John, on whether that is, has happened? Uh, and uh, I hope the answer is yes, but I'd be very interested. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and when it became ranking member, uh, that was one of the things we tried to fix. Uh, it has not been fixed. Uh, they still have uh, energy and commerce has jurisdiction. Oversight and government reform has jurisdiction. Judiciary, there's a lot of uh, other committees 
I think six different committees have some sort of piecemeal jurisdiction over this. And so one of the more frustrating things that we have to deal with on Homeland Security is that by not streamlining the jurisdiction, uh, you, you, bills get bogged down that shouldn't be getting bogged down. And we're trying to claw that back. I have a plan to do so if we get back into the majority that hopefully I've been, I'm already working with my counterparts uh, on the Republican side to try and do that. I know Benny Thompson, the chairman of the uh, subcommittee, uh, attempted to do the same thing. He's yeah. got a, he's got like a, how do I say, a, a handshake, if you will, from the other committees that they're not going to give us as much of a hard time as they have in the past. But we'll see how that goes. I mean, right now, Benny and I are working together and we're getting stuff done and we're just trying to deal with all the jurisdictional hurdles. We're still one of the more prolific uh, uh, bill producers in all of Congress Homeland Security. So we're doing okay. Well, good luck to you. And I do think there's bipartisan support for doing this, certainly in the committee. The problem is that chairs and ranking members of other committees have put in their time to get their jurisdiction and uh, are jealously guarding it. You know, it's, it's the rice Earth bowl. Is turf. Turf is turf, right? Yeah. You know that. Yeah, so. Uh, in addition to a war on terror, there's a war on turf. Uh, as I said, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I put, and, and it is hard, not just for members, uh, especially really good members like you uh, who want to get stuff done, uh, but it's also hard for the Homeland Department, which has to testify for, you know, as they used to say, 88 committees and subcommittees. I hope that number's gone down, but that is just a terrifying number. And it means that people who need to get their jobs done are testifying on the Hill. Not that oversight doesn't matter, but just saying that this is a bad situation. And um, as, as your grandmother, I guess, in a sort of way, uh, I'm expecting uh, you to get a lot done on this topic, just so you know. But no, yes, we're looking forward to doing that. That's for sure. All right. So let's get into some of the issues. Uh, as I just mentioned, when I introduced you, you spent the better part of two decades uh, as an organization, as an organized crime prosecutor, working all over the United States and the world. How did how does that experience impact your uh, service on the Homeland Committee and the agenda that you would like to set? And while we're at it, I did mention that you worked on border and uh I don't think there's anything in the news uh, bigger at the moment than the problem, sadly, uh, on the southern border. Um, yeah, so. somewhat of an issue now. Yeah. Um, well, I started my career in law enforcement 30 years ago, and um, uh, I was sent by Janet Reno to the southwest border in, in El Paso for a few years going after cartel not, you know, traffickers. I was then sent to Puerto Rico for two years. I did the first death penalty case, that's my only eligible case in Puerto Rico, and then went back to central New York where uh, from there I did cases from all over the world. I've been to 22 embassies and I've done every manner of organized crime and political corruption. And one thing I learned then and that which, which helps me at the committee now is uh, you had federal, state, local law enforcement that you always put together to try and go after the bad guys. They all bring different strengths to the table. And so uh, the task force concept was burned into my brain well before I got to Congress. And really, the, the issue is the same no matter what in law enforcement. It's making sure you exchange information in a timely manner and effective manner, and that you act upon that information. And you can only do that with working cross lines and working in different agencies and getting things done. So when I got to Homeland Security, uh, it's really the name of the game. That was what was the cause of 9-11, really, was the yep. siloing of information, not an adequate distribution of it and dissemination of it. Um, and it still brings true today to some extent. Uh, were much, much better. The task force concept that I used in the organized crime cases, they were called OCDF cases, has now been grafted onto uh, the anti-terrorism cases, the joint terrorism task forces, and there's much better right. exchange of information. But on January 6th, you saw that a lot of information still doesn't get to the right places sometimes, and it was a, another yet another painful lesson for us. But exchanging the information and acting on it is critically important, both uh, uh, locally, uh, statewide, uh, federally and internationally, and uh, we have international partners as well. So it's all about uh, information flow for sure. Well, I want to get to 9-11 because the 20th anniversary, imagine that. I, I was in Congress then walking to the dome of the Capitol, which was then the seat of the of the uh, intelligence committees, and, and most people think was the intended target of the fourth plane that went down in Pennsylvania due to the heroism of the passengers. Uh, I, want to, I want to get there, but... Um, can we stay on the border for one second? This Joint Terrorism Task Force idea, uh, is it being employed there? And 
uh, you mentioned uh, uh, narcotics. I mean, my theory of the case is it is a lot of people, sadly, uh, fleeing uh, violence in Central America, but that's, that's a piece of it. And so that's the push factor. But the pull factor is the drug trade in the United States and, and the corruption around drugs in Mexico. And I'm just wondering if that's right. And if you think that the coordination of various agencies is making a dent in that. Well, it, it, it depends, and it, it, but it starts with leadership in the White House. And we've had a, a very dramatic change in the way we see the border in this White House. Um, I, I can tell you this much, uh, the drug traffickers control the, the, the northwest border of Mexico, or the northern border of Mexico, that's just a fact. And that's why you're always seeing the drug cartels fighting for control of the borders because it's such a lucrative trade. It's lucrative for two reasons. One is the, um, uh, the trafficking of drugs, but the other is the trafficking of humans. And, it, it, and they both go hand in glove because you're not crossing the border as an illegal alien unless you uh, have the imprimatur of the drug organizations. And so the cooperation amongst law enforcement agencies is very strong, but the drug trafficking uh, drug traffickers know how to exploit the southern border. Right. And they see a weakness based on what happened with the president's executive orders on January 20th, and they're exploiting it. Uh, by all estimates, they made as much as $400 million in the month of February alone, trafficking 100,000 people across the border at an average of about 4,000 a person. And uh, the rates are higher for different people, but it's almost like the, the drug traffickers are making as much, if not more money on human trafficking now than anything else. Now we have our, the citizens in the Northern Triangle, we have citizens in Mexico and others, who want to make a better life for their, for their families. I understand that, I got that. But we've always been a nation of laws and we can't have real immigration reform until we have real uh, have an actually secured border. And what people aren't understanding about what's going on is human tragedy is that a lot of uh, uh, women, uh, at least a third on, on average are sexually assaulted along the way. No. Um, and the human trafficking element is very scary. I was leaving the El Paso airport to come back here on Monday and a flight attendant stopped me. And she had a very worried look on her face. And she says, I've been a flight attendant in El Paso for a long time. I'm always seeing the drug traffickers taking women and you know, clear that they have control over them. I just saw several on the flight just now. She goes, I've never seen anything like I'm seeing right now with respect to human trafficking going on. And it's really a tragedy. Well, I, I agree it's really a tragedy. I'm not, let's not have, have an argument about this, but there <laughs> also were amazing abuses that occurred, whoever was at fault during the Trump administration at the border and policies that uh, President Biden's trying to correct. This is a problem from hell. I think we could agree on that. And one piece of good news this morning, at least as I read my newspaper is that the Biden administration is making some progress with Mexico along the Southern border, trying to keep people in Central America and avoid this horrific uh, tra trafficking across Mexico where I'm, I remember being told that some of these young girls are being given birth control pills by their present, by their parents because, or what, whoever are their, their, their guardians because they, they fear they're gonna be raped along the, the Mexico, uh, uh, in their Mexico travel. Well, let's turn to something else. Uh, and I do wanna to get to your concept of your agenda for the committee because sure. I'm very interested, but you mentioned 9-11 and it will be the 20th anniversary in September. And it all, we are also struggling with understanding exactly what happened on, on January 6th in the Capitol, uh, a place I know well, but a place you, where you were physically. And in both cases, you just said it, and I you know, heartily agree, there was a breakdown or there was an absence of coordination among levels of law enforcement. And in, in the case of 9-11, uh, firefighters were, were, were climbing up the buildings as they were glowing red and, and police heli helicopters, this, the trade towers were circling and could see this, but they didn't have the same frequency and they couldn't communicate with the firefighters uh, to get out of there. And many were killed because of this absence of interoperable communication. So uh, 20 years later, uh, first of all, my, my condolences, you are a member from New York and uh, this was, a, uh, it hurt the whole country and the whole world, but it especially hurt New York. Uh, but secondly, do you think we are making progress in terms of learning lessons, both from 9-11 and 1-6? There's no question that we're a, we're a much safer country than we were before 9-11. I think the 9-11 Commission was uh, wildly successful. 
Uh, the recommendations were excellent and the exchange of information and the flow of information is much, much better than it was. And I think we're a much safer country because of it. And I think um, January 6th was, uh, was a definitely a breakdown in communications, but it wasn't from uh, a lack of developing that information. And it's always, you get the information and what do you do with it and how do you, how do you make it actionable? And uh, like the joint terrorism task forces were very, very good. But I think we need uh, for January 6th is another 9-11 style commission to look back and see from the capital standpoint, what, what, how do we fail? What can we do better? And how can we make sure this doesn't happen again? And balance that with the inter overarching interest that we want to keep the capital open to the public right. and have people come and enjoy their democracies. And uh, uh, we're going to get there, but it's all about information flow. And the 9 11 Commission did a great job. And I think if we have another similar commission for January 6th. I think we're going to be okay. And I've been speaking with Benny Thompson, the head of Homeland Security, and we're talking about formulating a bill to do just that. And I'm looking forward to working with him going forward. Well, good for you. I'll tell you someone who will support your bill in addition to me is Lee Hamilton, who was a co-chair, as I mentioned, of the 9-11 Commission and my predecessor at the Wilson Center, who called me recently uh, to um, you know, congratulate me on my decade of heading the Wilson Center, which I appreciated. But we started talking about this and he said he strongly supports the concept that uh, he and Tom Kane had uh, after 9-11 uh, being used this time. And learning more lessons. Sadly, we have to learn more lessons and we, we, we don't have full information yet about it. Now I can ask you, and I will, about cyber, emergency preparedness, China. I asked you about the border, but if somebody asked you, um, ranking member Capco, what is your agenda for the Homeland Security Committee? Um, what are, what's your agenda for the Homeland Security Committee? Well, I, I think it starts with identifying the trends that are endemic within the homeland security space now. And they're very different than they were in 9-11. Um, number one, there's really four that I, I'd like to focus on. And the first one is well, we're losing our strategic advantage because of cyber actors. And the homeland has never been more vulnerable in foreign, uh, in, for, from foreign incursions in our nation's history. For, and people always think about foreign incursions as someone coming into this country and uh, spies or terrorists or whatever. But they're able to do that from the, from the strength and uh, uh, comfort of their own homes, their own offices, and their own places in, uh, around the world. And that losing our strategic advantage in that regard from a geographic standpoint uh, is very important. Our borders are, make us a, a relatively self safe country compared to the rest of the world just because we have oceans on both sides and friendly countries to our north and south. But now uh, people don't need to travel here to, to make their incursions, and that's a very big difference. I think, too, um, our global interconnectedness has created new and potentially catastrophic domestic uh, resilience vulnerabilities. Uh, economic security and homeland security are, are completely linked due to the critical role that supply chain resilience plays in our homeland security mission. And that's another big thing, right? And we can talk more about that in the cyber realm. Third, I, I, don't, uh, I don't think we fully appreciate or know how to value data we generate and export from a security standpoint. Uh, we are generating unbelievable amounts of data and I don't think we always understand what that means and what the implications are. And I think perhaps um, one of the most important things from a Homeland Security standpoint is um, our entire Homeland Security model is predicated on a single abrupt incident and preventing that from happening, a car bomb in Times Square, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that happened in San Bernardino, California, what have you. That's the traditional model, but the, the modern model for Homeland Security is multifaceted. It's a multifaceted threat landscape, and it's, uh, we, we got to adjust to the long term. You got to think of it this way. Um, China uh, is playing the long ball with us, right? And China is looking for long-term dominance and weakening of the U.S. And, and more dominance for them in the world order. And they're playing the long ball and they're, they're here now. They're a threat now. And it's yep. a very different type of homeland security dynamic. So those four things, I think, really kind of form the conceptual underpinnings for how I view what we need to do going forward. Okay, well, I just heard bells. Is that the beginning of the vote or is that something else? Oh, no, we're, we're fine. We're fine. They're just, okay. they're just they could, the, the votes keep going, but we're okay for a while. Okay, well, just keep, you know, let me know we, it, how much more time do you think we have? We probably got about another 20, 25 minutes, so we're fine. Okay, minutes. well, yeah. um, let's, I want to ask about all of these things. Um, cyber, obviously. Uh, cyber, um, you have called cybersecurity a, a preeminent threat. That's your number one go-to that you just mentioned. Um, and you, you know, and yet here we are, uh, 
unable, I think, to continue our way of life if we don't have, you know, our, if we don't rely on all the things vulnerable to cybersecurity. You mentioned, I agree with you that, uh, uh, let me collapse it with your number four about we're still stuck in incident response and yet we need a new model. We surely mm -hmm. need a new model and cyber yep. is what offers that and what also uh, disrupts that. So, okay, if somebody said, John, uh, what should, do we need new legislation right now to deal with cyber? And if so, you know, hopefully legislation that the Homeland Committee has jurisdiction over. What are the few things that we, that you could do to harden, our, you know, our cyber, uh, to, to harden our cyber defenses and to make sure that we have uh, a much better protection in our country? I mean, if the question is, do we need more uh, legislation in the cyber realm? My answer is, oh, hell yes. <laughs> we need a lot. Because, like I said, that is, it's a metastasized threat in this country now that we've met the likes of which we've never seen before. It's really thinking it this way. If you're thinking from the old model, it'd be like you'd have an ISIS in everybody's house, uh, just waiting to, waiting to uh, spring in action at any time. That's, it. That's, that's the threat of cyber now, right? And um, so, yes, we need that, and we need it very well. Now, think about it. Not too long ago, if somebody had AOL connections in their home, that was their only connection to the internet. And that was the only vulnerability they had to, from the outside world. Now your refrigerator is a computer. Now you all have cell phones. You all have all kinds of electronic devices. Your TVs are smart TVs. I venture to guess that most homes have dozens of devices, advice, excuse me, devices that are attached to the internet. We also have government systems and, and uh, business systems that, that have a tremendous amount of data and a tremendous amount of uh, fortune to be had from the bad guys, but also uh, sensitive material that's transacted on these internets. And we got to make sure that they're, they're safe and protected. So if I, one of the things I, I, I have a five pillars that I've talked about all the time, and I won't go through all of them right now, but one of the central things I think we need to do is we need to have a quarterback for this. We don't have a quarterback on the team. CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, needs to be that quarterback. And we need to have CISA uh, and, uh, overseeing all of the .gov domain to start, but also be that quarterback for the for our cyber hygiene and cyber resilience going right. forward, right? And I think we need to take that and balance that and make sure that CISA and what they represent as a quarterback is 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 uh, fluidly interacting with both the defense, the dot mil uh, domain, as well as the Dep Department of Defense, but also the intel community. So you really have these three things. And so if cybers and CISA is a head coach. I mean, the, the quarterback, we need a head coach. And the head coach has got to be a national cyber director. And I'm hopeful that we're going to have one uh, up and running soon because we have a lot of things we need to do from uh, identifying the risks and having CISA in a strong role. And quite frankly, I need, if, they're, if they're not a $5 billion agency in the not too distant future, we've got a real problem because that means we're not, we're not fighting this. But then we need to understand uh, how to deal with everything from supply chain issues and software issues and vulnerabilities are created. And finally, developing strategies on how to whack the bad guys like China and Russia and Iran and, and North Korea when, they're, when they do things. And right now, there's not a lot of repercussions for what they're doing. Look what happened with SolarWinds and Microsoft. Well, we're not doing enough in that realm. This administration says more, more to come. Um, we'll see. But let, let me stick exactly. on this national cyber director. CISA uh, was uh, a, a strengthening of Homeland Security, the Homeland Security Department capacity and it came about, let me give a plug for somebody that you may know, uh, Suzanne Spaulding, who was in the role uh, as, as the first uh, CISA director and who basically conceptualized it and who used to work on the Hill uh, as director of the Democratic side of uh, HIPSI, the Home, the Intel Committee. So go Suzanne. Uh, but uh, I agree, the CISA needs to be strong, but you, there are other parts of the government. Are you saying this cyber commander would be based in the Homeland Department? Because let me put no, out a couple no, no, other no, places. No. There's cyber command in the Pentagon. Uh, and there is also now, uh, again, a, uh, I don't know what her title is, a, a Liz Sherwood Randall is the, the new Tom Bossert in the White House. Uh, Tom Bossert uh, served in the Trump administration and then not only was he let go, but his position uh, was demoted. And now there's a new person. So where would this cyber commander be? And let me put one more thing on the table. As you know, 85% of the internet is controlled by the private sector, which has in many respects, better skills and certainly uh, can attract uh, better talent because it pays better. 
than the government. And something we've done at the Wilson Center uh, under Meg's leadership is try to improve the trust between the private sector and the Homeland Department. So yep. where is this cyber, com cyber commander? And can we build enough control and authority in the federal government someplace uh, to make this work better and do the things you're saying we need to do? Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Let me try and do as best I can. It's called National Cyber Director, and he would be an executive level at the White House, right? And he's the seen the entire, House. he's the head coach. The thing that is, he's the head coach. He's doing the entire, he's looking at the entire playing field. And it's a tend to oversimplify it a bit, but defense, Department of Defense uh, has offensive and defensive capabilities. Right. Uh, uh, CISA would have the dot, and they're in charge of the dot mil domain. CISA will be in charge of the entire dot gov domain and also work with the private sector. And then you have the intel community to feed the information and make sure they're uh, they're 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 in coordinating with defense and CISA. So basically, the head coach is taking a look at those three three uh, segments of their team underneath. Then you got to have uh, you got to take a look at what you do with the information and, and how you do it, right? And that's that's what the, the cyber director I would envision doing. And he would be an advisor to the president and overseeing things. I, I liken it to what I did, what we did in the in the organized crime field with an office of national drug control policy. He had FBI, he had DEA, he had all these different agencies involved in drug enforcement, ICE and Customs and Border Patrol, everybody. And when we got the Office of National Drug Control Policy and a, and a drug czar, quote unquote drug czar, that worked out of the White House, he was able to better coordinate the interaction of and flow of information right. between them. And that's where the task force concept was developed. And then there's something else we need to do. We need to have a better job, do a better job with the private sector interaction with the uh, government cybersecurity community. And you do that um, by making sure that when they exchange information, they don't get themselves in the hot water. If there's a hack or a breach, that we should know about it so we can uh, develop best practices and better defenses. But we can't have a private sector business give us that information and then open themselves right. up to liability in the process, right? So those are all things we need to do. And the last thing I'll say, I'm sorry I'm prattling on, but this is a lot. Um, when I was had a TSA subcommittee, we really turbocharge the Aviation Security Advisory Committee. And in so doing, we have a better, much better public-private interaction. And we need to like an advisory committee at, at CISA and Homeland Security that is really, uh, really hones in on getting the private sector interaction and then you can have best practices and everything else. That is a great idea. I was on the advisory committee for a long time to the Homeland Department, but it didn't drill mm -hmm. down that way. I also co-chair with Michael Chertoff, former Homeland Security uh, 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 Director of the Department of Homeland Secretary, uh, something called the Homeland Security Experts Group with a lot of the oldies. Yep. Uh, but having some someone specific or an advisory committee there makes a lot of sense. So this national, this uh, cyber uh, director in the White House, this national director is not somebody they presently have. This is not Liz Sherwood Randall's uh, 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 file uh, or no, would she need no, that they, they need to they need to establish somebody and it, and, it, and it can't be somebody that is uh, uh, from the Intel community or working with the Intel community or just working with defense or just working with uh, homeland it's got to be someone that's above the fray that sees the entire field right and then can go to talk to the president and say here's what we need to do and go to Congress and say here's what we need to do and see it all of course you have the you know the three other the three sub agencies underneath it basically just sub subheads, uh, CISA and defense and intel. And then yeah. I think you have more synergy. And that's what we did in the drug realm. And I tell you what, a hell of a lot better inf information flowing going on that way. Well, let's see what happens. Okay, so we, we've discussed uh, cyber, sort of. You mentioned uh, supply chain, which is very much in the news, uh, semiconductor shortages and so on. What can you do in the Homeland Committee about supply chain? Well, there's a lot we can do, but at first of all, I got to just to tease out the supply chain just for a moment. Um, we had planes uh, called the AirBridge during this crisis for FEMA help to, to just to get personal protective equipment to the United States. Now think about that. Why do we let our uh, you know let ourselves be that vulnerable? When I was lived in Syracuse my whole life, uh, um, most of my life, uh, penicillin by, was made there by Bristol Myers, seventy percent of the nation's penicillin supply, right? Now, um, uh, none of it's made in the US. Uh, the component parts or most of it's right. made in China. What are we gonna do if we really uh, get, get in a bad way with China? And the way things going in Alaska, the talks right now, it's not too good. So we gotta think not as a protectionist type of thing, but as uh, understanding when the next pandemic hits, are we gonna be more 
uh, more secure as a nation. And we got to think about that. That's what supply chain is. And then the other aspect of supply chain is uh, component parts that we get for manufacturing, component parts and software. Is that supply chain software? Is that are those component parts? Are they safe? Are they accurate? Are they good? Are they cyber secure? That's what we need to know. Well, Biden issued uh, uh, several executive orders recently on supply mm -hmm. chain topics, one of which is yes. semiconductors. They're mm -hmm. executive orders. They're not legislation about that. But it was in the direction that you are talking about. It's also true in terms of pandemic preparedness that a Absolutely. lot of administrations dropped the ball. Let's understand. We had some a learning curve. We had three or four really bad uh, p pandemics or potential pandemics like H1N1. And then there was, uh, you know, a, uh, a, 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 a storage facility set up to be fully housed with all this stuff. And there was a rule book prepared. And I'm not blaming this on one administration, but it wasn't followed. We were left in a ditch uh, when this pandemic hit. And hopefully we're now building back better. Uh, but let's learn these lessons for the next administration. Let's make sure the Home, Homeland Security Committee uh, maybe enacts legislation to to make certain that presidents can't drop the ball. How, would that be a good no, idea? I, no, there's no question about that, and and, and uh, that's true on, on on a number of different fronts. That's true of FEMA, FEMA's role in doing this and giving okay. FEMA the authority it needs. All that's part of the supply chain and and, and trying to uh, in, in developing the resilience. And I think that's something we need to do. And going forward, uh, especially in the cyber realm supply chain is going to be critically important because that's what really happened with solar winds. Solar winds was one of the most egregious attacks in our country ever by the Russian, a foreign right. actor. And uh, it was, uh, we, we didn't do a good enough job vetting uh, uh, software and supply chain software for our government systems. And we got our ass kicked by it, uh, Frank, quite frankly. And we got to make sure that doesn't happen again as well. I, I couldn't agree more. And I also, I'm interested in what steps, additional steps, the Biden administration is going to take. Do you have any? Do you have confidence that they're doing the right things? I mean, some of this won't be public, and you probably know about it, and I don't. Uh, but I'm just saying uh, there are a variety of things that we can do, uh, and it's tricky responding to cyber attacks because we don't want to end up in a position where we get uh, whacked in a way that would really be more harmful than the response that we're giving. So. Um, uh, you know, I've talked to David Sanger at length about this, who's written several books at the Wilson Center, one of which is called The Perfect Weapon about cyber. I've got and that book on my shelf. And well, and it gives credit to the Wilson Center, just saying. But it, do you think, uh, he, he thinks this is a complicated issue. Uh, are there more things you can do, again, as ranking member of Homeland? Uh, There's absolutely no question right about it. There's no question about it. And I'm really heartened to see Benny Thompson, uh, the, the, the uh, majority leader and I, we're, we, we get along very well. It's, we have a great relationship Good. and we're on four square about what we need to do with cyber. And again, it goes back to the fundamental thinking of Homeland Security's mission as a whole. It's not those one-off events anymore. And we've got to think, what are right. the vulnerabilities and how are they different and how are they um, uh, different than before? And like I said, it's basically you have someone from ISIS sleeping in everyone's home and everyone's office and when they wake up and they want to smack us, they can by a cyber way. And that's the way we, we got to start thinking. Now. It's a terrifying no doubt we get it done. You're right. You're right. No, You're doubt, right. no doubt we can get it done. And Benny goes way back. I think he was the original uh, first ranking member, then chairman. And I certainly remember him coming to my congressional district in Southern California, where uh, in Torrance, California, the police wrapped up a terror cell, the first prison based terror cell. Uh, which was, you know, they had maps and, and plans. Uh, they'd done a series of gas station robberies to fund themselves. And they had all these plans to attack uh, 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 um, Jewish centers and military recruiting centers and so forth. And that was in the analog days. Now we're in the, you know, as you, as you have yes. pointed out, uh, way, way beyond that. So uh, final questions, because I know you have to go. China. Uh, yeah. As you, you you hinted that this morning, I uh, gathered the readout of the China meeting we had uh, in Alaska was was pretty rough that the Chinese spoke for 16 minutes, dragging us through the coals about all of our transgressions. And uh, I, I don't know whether we were surprised by that or we weren't surprised by that, but uh, certainly they they said we're the, uh, the cyber, cyber abusers, not they. I, and that, uh, you know, why are we uh, uh, accusing them of... Uh, 
of, of uh, uh, mistreating the Uyghurs when we have this long history of systemic racism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. W what can you do, uh, again, in your position to push back against China? Okay, here's the deal. Uh, when I was a prosecutor going after bad guys, the only thing the bad guys understand is strength. If we don't exhibit strength with respect to China, we're, we're screwed, okay? That's that simple. Uh, the bad guys are never going to give me information. The bad guys are never going to work with me unless he understood that I had the goods on him and that I'm ready to use it and I'm ready to smack them. And that's what I did. Um, it's the same concept here. It's a fact that right now China is engaged in genocide of the Uyghur people in Xinjiang province. It's just a fact. And there's one to three million people that are estimated to be in concentration camps, forced sterilization, forced abortions, uh, slave labor, and they're killing people. And by the definition under the UN, that's genocide. Why in the hell would we go to that country and celebrate the Olympics? And I think one thing we could do right off the bat to show China we're not screwing around anymore, move the Olympics to another venue that's a, that's a country that's not engaged in genocide. And I gotta ask you, when's the last time we had the Olympics in a, in a country that's engaged in genocide? So if we don't start taking stands like this against them, uh, we're in trouble. The recent hack for the Microsoft Exchange hack, it's mm -hmm. clearly a Chinese operation. We need to respond in, in, in like strength, like I referred to earlier. I'm not saying get into war with China. I am definitely not a war hawk. I've got a son in the military. That's the last thing I want to have happen. But if you don't uh, nip the problem in the bud now, you're going to have a, a much worse problem. It's kind of like just a fundamental uh, metaphor. A gang's in Syracuse, right? And I could, I could whack the gang now and, and, and take a stand against them, or I could turn to blind eye. And if I turn a blind eye in 10 years, that gang won't just be in Syracuse, it'll be all over upstate New York, maybe all over New York, and it spreads. So it, it, China is playing the long ball. They literally want world domination and they literally want to, to harm the United States. They're, they're the primary uh, and, uh, and most sophisticated cyber attackers and they have massive human rights violations. So if I was them and I went to Alaska, I'd do exactly what they did, deflect because they had no other choice. Because if they don't talk about what's going on in their homeland, they got big problems. Well, uh, yes, um, I, I, in my book, I say in the 90s, uh, we missed China's rise. Uh, we thought that he wanted to yeah. be like us. We were the sole superpower in the world and why wouldn't they wanna be us? Well, they didn't wanna be us. We also missed terrorism's rise. And then we were surprised, and we're not missing this on 9-11. And then my view is we overreacted in, in military terms to 9-11, we had other options. I don't mean that we shouldn't have gone into Afghanistan uh, after those who attacked us. I voted for the authorization to use military force for that. But that authorization is still in force 20 years later, oh my God. Uh, and we've used it in, uh, in 19 uh, countries, of, again, if, in 40 military actions, and we've shortchanged other options that we have. This is my view anyway. Uh, you know, the diplomatic option, the soft power right. option. Right. And I bet you agree with me. So I now, do. With, now with China, to, to quote Cherry Ford, can't we walk and chew gum at the same time? Can't we be tougher, which we need to be, and also uh, figure out a range of other tools that we have where we could cooperate on a few things, maybe climate is one. I mean, otherwise we're not gonna solve the, the climate problem if we leave China out. Uh, we could cooperate there and maybe we could compete effectively uh, in the trade area. And I kind of think some of the things we're trying to do now and we were trying to do um, pre-Trump uh, in terms of bolstering uh, our trade relationships in Asia would be very positive. Yeah, I think there's three things that I would do with, with China. Um, and if you do this, I think everything else can flow from it, including the things you're talking about. You're never going to get to that step, in my opinion, unless you um, do these things. You need to counter, you need to curb, and you need to compete with them, right? You need mm -hmm. to counter... Um, when they do something like the incursion they just had, we need to whack them. When they're involved in genocide with the Uyghurs in the Northwestern provinces, we need to take a moral stand and say, this isn't right, and move the Olympics. I'm saying cancel them, move them. Uh, curbing, we have to educate state locals uh, as to what's going on. When the Chinese government comes in and says, I wanna give $100 million to your university so you can educate Chinese people, uh, ask the question and do the checking. Are they part of the Communist Central Party? Are they here to give you money and entice you and then steal all your, all your trade secrets on the back end? And then you need to compete with them. It's not a binary challenge. It's, uh, it's not a home and away game anymore. We need to compete with them on the international stage. We need to compete with them on the actions that they're doing. And I think if you do that, you're bargaining from a position of strength. Right now, 
Um, I think we're so afraid to offend the, the 800 pound gorilla that the 800 pound gorilla is gonna be a 1600 pound gorilla if we don't watch it. So I think we've gotta we've got to face the facts that we have some tough things that we need to do. And um, I'm heartened somewhat by what the, what the administration did today yes. up in Alaska. They kind of said, we ain't taking this crap. And that's a good thing to do. I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. And you know, they may become a 16 pound gorilla no matter what we do, again, because we missed the rise and we had opportunities to shape things that we missed over four right. administrations. I'm not just, you know, criticizing one, right. one place, but I do think that from what I can tell, the Biden administration uh, intends to continue being tough where we should be tough. And that was a good thing that the Trump administration did. I don't know that it was followed by an adequate strategy and hopefully it now will be, but we'll have to see. And Congress does yes. have a role. Congress does. You're looking at the clock, so I don't want to be unfair. Is there anything that I left out asking you about that you would like to communicate to the enormous number of people uh, on this Zoom call? And uh, in addition to the fact of, of how much you appreciate the Wilson Center, I'll just put that out well, there. Well, quite, quite frankly, I, I, uh, in preparing for this today, uh, I, I realized uh, how much I need to learn still, and but how much I need the input of people like you and folks at the Wilson Center. I think it's really important that we have these discussions. Um, I'd be happy to come back again and do more of a Q&A type thing because I think that's another way to do things. But you know, going forward, uh, uh, we've got to understand the, the threat that China is. We've got to understand that Homeland Security is a different uh, uh, protection matrix than it was even just a few years ago. And we got to we got to we got to act accordingly. But you know what? In the end, we can't do things unless we work together. And I don't want to say sing we are the world here, but I'm one of the most bipartisan members in all of Congress, and I was just rated one of the most effective is again. Um, and uh, I'm pissed because I'm rated number two most bipartisan by the Luger Center, not number one. And uh -oh. really, but I'm working it. on it. If something one. happens, a Congressman Fitzpatrick, you can blame me because he's number one. <laughs> but, uh, well, he's pretty good too. I, but I we've got to strive. We've got to strive to be bipartisan. We've got to strive to get past the, the partisan on both sides. It's still all over the place here. And if January 6th taught us anything, it's that we got to put the swords down, man. And we got to work together for the good of our country. And I'm willing to do that. Well, well when, Mike, when I chaired the Intel Subcommittee of Homeland and Mike McCall was my ranking yep. member, he later became chairman of your yep. committee. Uh, he used to, uh, he loved my quote, which is the terrorists aren't going to check our party registration before they blow us up. That's we exactly, really that's a perfect way to end right here. I got to run. On that. You I can use run. my Thank you so much. Back. I'll come back anytime. Well, you were great. You were just great. Right. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks a lot. All right, Take God care. bless. God bless bye everybody. Bye-bye.